Good morning, church. We're going to need our Bibles today. This is our final part of our series in the book of Psalms. And today we're going to need our Bibles. So come with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. You can find it on page number 1125 on the CIV Bibles. And if you're new to CIV and you're not familiar with church, We do have these orange Bibles that you can find at our welcome desk. You can grab one. You'll be able to follow along because we call out page numbers. And you can have it. And we will invite you to come again so that you can continually grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who we serve. Book of Hebrews, chapter 3. And we're going to begin our reading at verse 7. We'll make our way down. To verse 11. Follow along as I read. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. The book of Hebrews quotes Psalm 95. In Psalm 95, we read about the shouts of praise, we read about the songs and the invitation into the presence of God. And it starts on this this high note, this high celebratory note, and then all of a sudden, there's a sudden shift. It goes into this warning. And I believe that most people focus on the first two parts of the psalm of praise, the shouts and adoration, the invitation into God's presence but we don't follow the warning that comes at the end of the text. I believe the devil has done a great job at keeping us preoccupied with praise so that we neglect God's word on the topic of worship. Today's subject title is the heart of church civil war. We are talking about worship today. Gracious Father in heaven, Jesus, your only Son and eternal Spirit. Father, we have sung songs and said things to be true of you. But right now, we want to hear from you, Lord. This is your turn to speak to your people. So rid me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit. So as you lead us and guide us and walk before us, May we choose to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A wife said to her husband, Babe, I had the strangest dream. It was about my birthday that's coming up soon. And I dreamt about a bracelet and a necklace. What do you think it means, babe? And with a cheeky smile, the husband said, you wait till your birthday. Just you wait till your birthday, baby. Well, the big day came. Oh, and she couldn't control her excitement. She tore the package that her husband gave to her, ripped it open, and on the inside was a book titled, How to Interpret Dreams. Sometimes we just don't get it. We just don't get it. And when it comes to worship, we just don't get it. You see, you can worship God whenever you want. You can worship God wherever you want. But you cannot worship God however you want. Right? Instead of worship coming through him to God, the devil wanted worship to come to him. 
This led to his fall from heaven, and then he, was, he tempted Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, instead of worshipping God, they believed the, the false lies that the devil had spoken to them about God, and so they fell as well. And so missions and evangelism is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Mission only exists because worship does not. And here's something important. If we do not worship God, God will not be diminished, but we will. Because worship is an incredible privilege. It's not a religious duty. Worship rolls out the red carpet for the presence of God. Worship is a declaration of war against any ideology that speaks against the power of God. True worship is not measured by the sincerity of the worshiper. Often we gauge our worship by how we feel as we're worshiping, but true worship is measured by God alone. We understand praise, shouts of joy and singing songs. We understand the invitation into worship. But we have redefined worship, and in doing so, we have lost its true essence. You see, when the book of Psalms, book of Hebrews, sorry, when it quotes Psalm 95, it's bringing a powerful warning to us today. It's warning us against a lack of faith and obedience to God's ways and commands. So just like the faithless generation in Meribah. Meribah is that generation who God judged for being disobedient often, over and over again, that God said, you will not enter into my rest. God said, you will not enter into the promised land. And so God had his people walk around for 40 years until every last one of that generation died. And then the next generation was allowed to enter into the promised land. And so the book of Hebrews quoting Psalm 95, God is speaking to us. He's speaking to us today saying, those who repeat the faithless disobedience of that generation will not enter into his rest. Psalm 95 drives home the point that worship is more than just an act of formal praise. It affirms that God deserves both praise and obedience. Genuine praise isn't just what we say about our, with our lips about the Lord. It's about how our lives are surrendered to him. This may upset you, but praise is not worship. It is a means to worship as a response to the rock of our salvation. Worship, biblically, is obedience to God's ways and commands. And the resting place of God will be closed to those who only praise. Now, the first time we encounter this word worship in the Bible, it comes in an unexpected place. It's, it comes at a time where there's no singing. There's no choirs, there's no hymn, there's no music of any sort. There's no praise leader, there's no musicians. Just two people, an old man and a young man. It's not built from a stage, it's not built from music, it's not built from singing, but it's built from obedience to whatever God commands. And the setting is Mount Moriah. God says, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Almost every time I speak about Genesis chapter 22, someone will always come to me at the end of the service and say, I cannot believe God asked that of Abraham. You know, people get so upset when they read God's command to, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. I always respond with, well, where's the same energy for God's sacrifice? Because God supplied a ram for Abraham's son. Isaac didn't die, but God's son of promise, there was no ram for him. Where's the same energy for God's son? What I love about this story is that, that Abraham does not delay his obedience. He just gets up the next morning and he followed God's command. And look at this. He calls the act worship. Worship is not singing. Worship is obedience. 
A point that's often missed in the text is that Abraham is into his hundreds. And Isaac, even though the Bible doesn't tell us how old he is, most scholars think he's a young teenager, so Isaac could outrun his elderly father. So what we missed in the text is that it says, I and the boy will go and worship. This means Isaac went to worship as well. And so Abraham's worship was showing through his obedience in sacrifice, and Isaac's worship was showing through his obedience in submission. Following God by your emotions and being led by your emotion won't lead you to this type of worship. God asked Abraham for his son of promise that he waited a hundred years to receive, and he was obedient to give it up. The devil cannot steal anything from this type of worship. And in this moment, church, there's no hymn, no music, no singing, just two lives, obediently surrendered to God. Corey Ten Boom writes, I have learned to hold all things loosely so God will not have to pry them out of my hands. You know, we, we hold on to certain things we don't want to let go. Right? And then when God comes asking for them, God has to pry our hands off. And she's saying, you've got to hold everything loosely so when God comes calling, he doesn't have to pry them out of our hands. Pastor Daniel Hans from Pennsylvania, he found this out, to be, found this out the hard way. He wrote a book about it called God on the Witness Stand, Questions Christians Ask in Personal Tragedy, where he describes how he watched his daughter die he writes that seeing one's child slowly die forces a re-examination of all that one holds yet easily takes for granted. Life, love, God. For two weeks, I watched my daughter slowly waste away. And then in his book, he writes about this imaginary dialogue that he has with God where he is in the courtroom and he's the prosecutor and God is on the witness stand. And he knows that this is not originating from him, but he takes this from the book of Job. And this is what he writes. He's the prosecutor here. God, I speak now from my heart rather than my mind. I put away the mind's argument and my heart cries out. You have no idea what it's like to watch your child slowly die. You have no idea how I am feeling and how I am hurting. God, you forget that I do know what it's like to lose a child, an only child. You do not think his suffering was real? You doubt that his death was agonizing to me? The prosecutor, I do not deny that the reality of his death. However, he had the resurrection awaiting him. He had the hope within his grasp. God, isn't that the same hope available to you? You need more than a creator and a sustainer who can guard life as it is in this moment. I can restore that which is broken, save that which is lost, Resurrect that which is dead. Pastor Hans, I believe that. But still, I do not understand why my daughter must be the experiment for the theory. It does not make sense that this should be tested on a three-year-old. I do not understand such happenings. God, nor will you fully understand. Your mind demands explanation and answers, yet the greatest need is of the heart. You need meaning in tragedy more than understanding of tragedy. You need love to fill the void. You need hope in a painfully depriving world. You ask my reasons. They are beyond you. Instead, I give you something useful. I give you myself. I am at the center of all life. I can bring meaning to the most perplexing mysteries. I ask of you but one thing, that you trust me. No matter how confusing and painful, trust me. I could have given answers to your questions, but answers would not have made any difference. You do not need my answers. You need me. Worship is not devoid of emotions, but it should not be driven by them. True worship is a deliberate decision to obey and trust God even when the path ahead seems uncertain and unexplainable. When God instructs us, do not lean on your own understanding. It's because he knows that our hearts can be deceitful and our emotions can fluctuate and our understanding is limited. 
Remember, God cannot lie. He never changes. He knows everything, so he can be trusted. Graham Kendrick writes this, Worship has been misunderstood as something that arises from a feeling which comes upon you, but it is vital that we understand that it is rooted in the conscious act of the will to serve and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, my fear is that worship in the modern day is so focused on emotions and singing and the style of worship. I mean, why did we turn worship into singing? For as long as I've known to be an Adventist Christian growing up in the Adventist faith, we have always made worship about singing. We sing songs and then we conclude and go home and think we worship. Right? Some of us have convinced ourselves that there are certain style of music that is acceptable to God and other styles that are not acceptable to God. If that's you, that's blasphemy. Because you've placed yourself in a position of judgment over music and the only person that can judge worship is God. And so when you judge worship, the moment you say, that's not worship or I don't like that worship, you play God. And you commit a grave sin of blasphemy to put yourself in that position. Church, how long would we allow the devil to plant erroneous ideas about worship, creating civil war within the church about worship. For too long, worship has been about coming to a building, watching others serve, and then we go home and say, I worship. How long are we going to allow this devil to hurt our church with these erroneous ideas? The devil's winning the battle by turning worship into singing. Let me tell you why he does this. Because singing makes no demands of our lives. But worship will call for obedience. Worship will make a demand on your life. It is so much easier to sing a song on the screen than to let go of something that God is asking for us to release. Let's consider the story of Job. It says this, at this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head and then he fell to the ground in worship. In worship. The context to this is that he's just got this devastating news that he's, he's, his wife and children ha have died and his possessions are lost. In chapter 2, we're going to learn that his health deteriorates but right now he's grieving and part of his grieving process is, is to tear his robe and to shave his head but the text tells us he fell to the ground and he worshipped. We read the book of Job, he asks so many questions. So you can ask your questions of God, you can lament to God, God can handle your questions. Please, ask God your questions, but your questions can wait, worship cannot. Worship is the best cure for a wounded spirit. Because God is okay with you asking why, but don't let your why get ahead of your worship. Job had many whys. Why is this happening to me? Why is that going on, Lord? But it arose from a place of worship. This is why Job could conclude after everything that naked I come from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Look at his word. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When you lack answers, you can worship and encounter the answer. The devil cannot steal anything from this type of worship. In this moment, there's no hymn, there's no music. There's no singing, just one life obediently surrendered to God. David, then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house at his request. They served him food and he ate. David had just committed murder to cover up his adultery. The prophet Nathan comes in and gives God's judgment that the son from that adultery relationship will die. And when Nathan left, the child is sick. And so David is mourning and he's pleading with God to, 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 to forgive him. 
And as he's lying on the ground and he's prostrated and he's devastated, he's not eating, he's, he's just calling out to the Lord to please save this child. When he learns that the baby has died on the seventh day, this is the moment. That's the context of this verse. After he learns of the child's death, he gets up, showers, puts on cologne, changes his clothes, and before he takes care of his physical need, before he eats, he takes care of the spiritual. He goes into the house of the Lord and he worships. David's servants are looking at the king and they're marveling at his worship. What kind of king is this that he would be so surrendered that he trusts God's decision to be just and still worthy of worship? Church, there's no hymn. There's no music, no singing, just a life surrendered to God. This type of worship is beyond the devil's reach. You see, in Psalm 95, when they come in towards the sanctuary, there's an intense shout, come, let us, let us sing for joy to the Lord. There's an invitation into the presence of God. And then when they get into the sanctuary, it's not let us sing and worship, but it's, look at the posture, let us bow down and let us kneel. Worship is a surrender. It is a submitting, this bowing down, this, this kneeling before the king, Sometimes I just see people coming into church with the posture, God's lucky I showed up today. I could have been doing anything else. Lord, you should consider this. I could have done this. I could have fixed the house. I could have been at, you know, at the shops. You should consider yourself lucky, Lord, that I'm here. Corey Ten Boom, worshipers, don't just lift their hands in praise. They have open hands. Because God doesn't need to pry their hands away from anything because God has access to their whole lives. If you do not plan to live the Christian life, K. Arthur writes, totally committed to knowing your God and to walking in obedience to him, then don't begin. For this is what Christianity is all about. It is a change of citizenship, a change of governments, a change of allegiance. If you have no intention of letting Christ rule your life, then forget Christianity. It is not for you. Worship is the ultimate purpose for which humans were created. God says, I have made them for my glory. Worship is meant to be our way of life. Everything we say and do should be an act of worship before God. And so let me clarify something important. Music is not worship. Music is a means to worship, but it is not worship itself. Music doesn't motivate or induce worship. Instead, it gives expression to our love, to our awe, to our adoration for God. It enhances and enriches our worship, but the motive for all our songs is not a sound or a style of music. It is a truth. And that truth is a person, Jesus Christ. Worship is not about attending church and singing and playing an instrument and raising our hands in praise. These, are acts, these acts are elements of worship, but they're not the totality of it. They can be evidence of worship, but authentic worship goes beyond the outward demonstrations or corporate performances. A simplified definition of worship can be stated here. It is a heart attitude of bowing down in reverence and humility before the supreme Lord and creator of the universe. To worship is to respond with our whole being in adoration, exaltation, humble submission, and obedience to God. This big idea changed my life about worship. I mean, I thought I knew worship until I found this big idea, which changed it for me. Now on Fridays, I sit with the Lord and I, and I reflect on my week, where I worship well, where I didn't worship well. Did I, how did I worship with my time? How did I worship with my money? So that by the time I walk through this building, it doesn't matter what happens here. I'm ready for worship. I don't need music. I don't need to have certain people up. I'm ready. I've come prepared with my worship, my offering to God. I don't need what happens up here anymore. 
And this is why I got to this point with this big idea that I know is going to change your life. And here's the, here's the big idea. Worship is the only thing you can give to God that he has not first given to you. Do you catch that? Everything else that has been given to you, God has given to you first. Worship's the only thing that you can give to God that He hasn't given to you first. That's how precious and important worship is. This is why the devil has brought these erroneous ideas to get us fighting amongst ourselves because of how important worship is. And so God just desires to worship with you. He wants you to worship Him. Does our worship enrich God? No. If you're obedient with your money, God is no richer. Right, if you give God your strength, God is no stronger. If you give God your wisdom, he's, He doesn't learn anything new. Right, God just wants your worship, not for what it does to Him, but what it will do for you. Because if you worship, we become like what we worship. And if we worship Jesus with our whole being, we become like Jesus in every way. You're probably sitting here going, oh, pastor, it's so easy for you to say surrender, submit, worship. You don't know what I'm going through. You're up there preaching and your life is easy. Well, let me be vulnerable with you. And I'm not being vulnerable because I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm just gonna be vulnerable because I want you to know that I'm not, this is not a matter of me having to preach or practice what I preach. I'm preaching what I'm practicing. Worship brought me and my family to Canada. When I was in seminary, my wife and I, we made the decision that if a call came, that we would let our kids know where that call was and that our kids will make the decision. And so because of that, if my kids said yes or no, we would obey because that was how God was going to speak to us. And so when Canada came, right, my kids had said no to previous calls. So when Canada came, we gave it to our kids and they deliberated whether we come to Canada. My wife and I, we had two grandkids. And with these grandkids, we were thinking about how, where we're going to settle, how we're going to you know, partner with our children, raising our grandkids. And we were thinking our kids most likely say no to Canada. But they said yes. And my wife and I, we had to have a moment to ourselves. It wasn't the answer that we were hoping for. But after that moment, we set our eyes to Canada and we worshipped and we came and we're here. If we followed our feelings, we wouldn't be here. We would have made up some story. I don't know if the Lord actually said that, right? Because that's what we do when we are led by our emotions, but we're here. The first year we arrived, a tax straight away, the moment we landed, it put my family in a really dark place. Picture me, new in this country, I'm in your homes visiting, I'm in doing board meetings, I'm in the hospital, I'm at hospital holding the hands of someone that's dying, and then I'm going home, and every night I'm walking downstairs to check if my kids are breathing, because I'm so worried of the darkness that covers them, and then show up to church, and serve you again. Go through meetings, visit. Every night go down, check if my kids are okay. Because the darkness that we were trying to survive. Second year we're hoping, okay, maybe we've worshiped this first year, maybe the second year will get better. No, family members start dying left, right and center. We had five, six, seven, eight funerals. You think that was tough? No. We get news there's a house fire that almost claimed the life of my mom and my niece. And we're over here stranded. We couldn't get there because of our visa status, but we're still here worshiping. And you think that was tough? No, the toughest was when we had our grandchildren, two grandboys, 
break four days separate from each other. And we couldn't get to Australia to look at them. We were stuck here for four months. And by the time we got to Australia and we held our, our grandbabies, they weren't newborns anymore. And the reality of the call hit me. I can never get that back. I can never look at them as a newborn because I was here worshipping. Not following my feelings, not being led by my emotions, just walking in obedience with the Lord. But God is good because now my family's coming out of that darkness. He's doing so good with my daughter, opening doors for my son, opening doors for my wife. And we are still here in Canada worshiping. We're not going nowhere. The devil cannot steal this type of worship. There's no singing that happened in our house. And even if we tried, we cannot sing. There was no hymn, no music, just the four of us holding tight as family and God providing angels from this church that was loving and supporting us. Isn't God worthy of worship? Isn't He worthy to follow without our emotions and our feelings? Isn't He worthy of our time and our finances? Isn't He worthy? If He's worthy, well, let's sing this last song with great adoration and joy. And as you leave this place, may you take your worship to a whole nother level in your obedience to our Father because He is so worthy and deserving of our worship.